My name is Brad Sarian. I am one of the pastors here at Restored. Uh, and yeah, I have, uh, this morning's a little different. I'm going to give kind of an extended announcement, some information at the beginning, and then, uh, then I'll preach. Um, but it has to do with the sermon, sermon series, and all that stuff. So um, we've been in the book of Genesis since the beginning of January. We kind of were planning on walking through that uh, verse by verse, not necessarily verse by verse, but main sections. Uh, and we just finished chapter 11 uh, two weeks ago. And so my plan at the end of last year was to kind of do Genesis for as long as we were going to. Um, but we are a part of a family of churches. So what that means is we don't exist on our own by ourselves, uh, but we're connected to other churches, both here in Southern California and around the globe. We have about 10 churches, uh, 10 gospel works. Um, five of them are in Southern California, then Denver, South Africa, North Africa, and India. And so um, we are interconnected to, to other brothers and sisters, which is really a joy of mine to not feel like we're kind of on our own little lonely island. Um, but when a bunch of us lead pastors went away to Denver in December of last year, we were kind of praying through, talking through some things, and we felt like it made sense to take a six-week, eight-week chunk right after Easter this year to spend um, doing a sermon series together collectively on what is the church. Um, initially, when I was in that room, the idea was thrown out there, and I did not love the idea because I'm a planner, and I would already had 2024 fully mapped out. And so I said, hey, guys, I'm already doing Genesis. I don't want to do that. I got my thing. Um, and I willingly... Uh, after some time, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm down to join. I didn't want to be the, the guy who's not a part of that. And so, um, I, and I really do believe it'll be really healthy, healthy and helpful for our church. So we're going to pause Genesis uh, for a little bit so that we can be connected to the family of churches. Uh, there's an old phrase that maybe you've heard of before. Uh, it says that if you want to go fast, go alone. Uh, but if you want to go far, go together. Um, and that that is, I think that's very, very true. I love to go fast. And so there's oftentimes something in me that's like, I just got to go by myself. Um, but the reality is as a church family, we don't just want to go fast. Um, we, we really want to go far. And so we do things together. And so we're going to be doing that sermon series together. And um, part of the reason we're pausing Genesis until the fall is because my wife and I are actually going to be taking a sabbatical this summer. So... Someone's excited. Thank you. Um, I won't be offended by that, that you're excited I'm going to be gone. But um, we, we're excited. Uh, we, we really are. And uh, it's going to be uh, June, July, August. And I just wanted to take a few minutes just to explain that because I think for some people, they hear that and it like, makes them nervous, like what's going on? Depending on your background in church, sometimes sabbaticals have been used very poorly and it's kind of like, we got to get this guy out of here, here's a sabbatical, and then hopefully people forget about you. Um, that's not what's happening. Um, it's, it's not, and I don't think it is. Um, and so here's, here's what's happening. Um, our family of churches, about three years ago, uh, created a policy that every seven years, the lead couple would get a three-month sabbatical. And so uh, initially when I heard about that idea, I was like, nah, not for me. I, we don't need that. Like everyone else can do that, not us. We just keep running. We like going fast. And so um, over time, I realized that it would actually be really healthy for my family. It'd be really healthy for our church family uh, for us to be gone for a few months. And so we're going to be doing that this summer. Um, I really will miss you guys. And um, we... There's a few, few main reasons why we're doing it. Uh, one, it, I've, I've read a few books on sabbaticals. I can't do something without reading books about that thing. And there are books about sabbaticals. And so um, one of the most helpful things it, that, that I read was that sabbaticals are best used when they're proactive rather than reactive. Um, sometimes pastors do. They, they burn out and then they're like, I need a break. It's like, well, or, or not even just pastors, anybody. You burn out in what you're doing and you take some time off. The reality is that won't heal you. Uh, Kerry Newhoff, he's, he's a pastor and leader. He, he has a great line. He says, time off can't heal you is if what your problem is, is how you spend your time on. And so if you're burning out and then you try to take a break to heal, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, but if you use breaks proactively, they can sustain you for the long haul. Um, and so that was a huge 
reason for me to take it. Because I was like, I don't feel tired. I don't need it. Let's keep running. Uh, it's like, no, it's actually good so that you can keep going. Um, there's a quote uh, from Tish or- Warren Har- uh, Harrison Warren. She's an Anglican priest. She was writing in the New York Times uh, recently, and she said, a recent study from Barna, a Christian research organization, showed that pastors are struggling with burnout at unprecedented levels. Barna reported that in March 2022, the percentage of pastors who have considered quitting full-time ministry within the past year sits at 42%. The sharp rise was first seen in November 2021 with the number of pastors who reported that they were considering resignation up nine percentage points from January 2021. Um, So, almost half of pastors in the last couple of years have, have seriously considered resigning from pastoral ministry. Uh, I, I don't want to just pastor for a few years. I, I want to pastor till I die. Um, and so to be able to take a few months off every seven years is, is really compelling. And so I'm excited for that. Um, I really do believe it's going to be best for our church. Um, Sarah and I lead the church. We're grateful that we planted the church eight years ago. Um, it feels like the church is our baby. It's like we started it in our living room and, and it can be easy almost to think that this whole thing revolves around us because we started it. A sabbatical is gonna be an incredible opportunity for you and us to see everything's gonna be okay. Um, that, that this church is actually about Jesus. It's not about any individual. Um, and as the church continues to stay healthy and mature and grow in unity um, without us here, it's like, oh, sweet, cool. Um, and then the last selling point for me uh, with the sabbatical was, was really uh, my children. Uh, my son is 10, or he's 11 now, and now Emma is nine, turning 10. Um, when we announced the sabbatical at our membership meeting back in January, I was just giving a couple of reasons why we're doing it. And then I saw my children, they were sitting at a table right here, bored out of their minds at a membership meeting. <clears throat> and I just began crying. Um, my kids sacrifice a lot for this church. And uh, the, the reality is Sarah and I sacrifice a lot for the church, but we signed up to sacrifice a lot for the church. Our kids never signed up to do that. Um, they have people in their home all the time. Um, they, they don't often, we do our best with boundaries and phones and all that kind of stuff, but they, they encounter mommy and daddy oftentimes distracted with the weight of ministry, the weight of other people's problems. I mean, there's always, people are always losing family members. There's always cancer. There is always unemployment. There is always so much that weighs so heavy on us. And so for us to be able to get an opportunity with our kids for three months straight without any distractions, with just us being able to be fully present, I'm very excited for. And so that's coming this summer. Um, Thank you for your support. Thank you for the one person who's very excited about my sabbatical. Um, And so I just wanted to share that, give you guys some, some time that's happening. Um, Andy Rogers, who's the lead pastor of Restored Uptown in San Diego, he and his family are going to move up here for six weeks during the sabbatical and just help lead during the interim. Um, And I'm really excited for that. He's going to be doing a a series most of the summer around emotionally healthy relationships. That is his like bread and butter. He just, yeah, he was mapping the whole thing out and I was like, I'm sad I'm going to miss this. So I will be podcasting it once I get back. Um, but you are all in wonderful hands. And so that's my lengthy intro to my sermon. I'm going to pray and then we'll preach. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace and your kindness on us. Thank you for these men and women and kiddos that you love deeply. As we dive into your word, would you, Holy Spirit, open our hearts? Would you help us see you more clearly, that we would see what what you have for us today and for the season? We trust that you're better than everything else, Lord. We love you. It's in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Don't worry, I'm going to try to preach a little shorter too, because that was a long intro. So, uh, Matthew 13, if you've got a Bible, run over to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we are going to be looking at a parable today, a uh, parable of the sower, parable of the soils, uh, depending on 
what you want to call it. Uh, but the reason why is because Genesis kind of breaks Genesis 1 to 11 and then Genesis 12 to 50 are two major breaks in the book of Genesis. And because we did Genesis 11 two weeks ago, um, I was going to preach Genesis 12 this morning, but then it would be really funky to start that and then have to come back to it in the fall and give you a recap and reminder of Abraham and the calling to the nations and all that. So I decided I'm just going to preach out of Matthew because I spent the last year and a half uh, basically sitting and just meditating and working through Matthew in my own personal time in the mornings with Jesus. Um, I would read a little section and then I would uh, be helped by a commentary, uh, Frederick Dale Bruner. He wrote a commentary on Matthew. This is part two of his commentary. He has two parts of Matthew and there's like 1,700 pages. So if you, I don't know how you write that much about 28 chapters, but people do it. Um, and as I was sitting in Matthew for a year and a half, there were some weeks I would read and I was just like, oh, I wish I could preach this. And I was like, one day. And so today's the day. I'm preaching some of that stuff. So uh, Matthew 13, we're going to look at this parable um, and then apply it and, and look at what Jesus has for us. So the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, verse 1. If you got a Bible, great. If not, we'll throw it up on the screens. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Just pause there. I was just reading that this week. I just love that verse. It's just so simple. It's like it's prepping us for the main thing. But I just got this picture of Jesus just sitting out looking at the, the sea. It's like he, he was, Jesus, he is fully God and fully man. Many people in the church overemphasize his deity, that he is just God, that we forget his humanity. And over and over throughout the Gospels, we see these just glimpses of his humanity. Him just sitting by the water. And, and his moment of enjoying his time by the water is about to be interrupted by a large group of people. Um, but, but I just f thought that's worth pausing for. Verse 2. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Um, I got to go to Israel when I was 19 uh, and, and they, around the, the Sea of Galilee, they have uh, different areas where they think maybe this happened. And basically there's basically just places where there's kind of a cove where you could have put the boat out a little bit um, and then how noise projects over water. Jesus could have preached to thousands of people just over the water, kind of into this area. And so it's fun thinking about him kind of before face mics were a thing. He literally using the water to project his voice. Verse three says this. Then he told them many things in parables saying, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some 30 times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. So, this parable is, is one of Jesus' stories. And, and in some ways, it's, it's one of the more important parables. In Mark chapter four, after Jesus tells the same parable, the disciples ask him, what does it mean? And Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand any of the parables? So it kind of acts as, as a very important parable to uh, help us understand not just this parable, but all of the parables. And one of the reasons I love this parable is because Jesus later gives his interpretation of what the parable means. Sometimes in, in the Gospels, you read a parable and you're like, I'm really confused, not sure what's going on here. This one, Jesus goes, let me tell you what this is about. Here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. And so fortunately, we'll get there in a moment. But a parable, what is a parable? Uh, one of my favorite definitions is from uh, a Bible scholar named C.H. Dodd. He says, a parable is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer, 
by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt of its precise application to tease it into active thought. A little bit of a mouthful there, but basically, Jesus taught in parables. He taught in stories because stories do something to us. They do something to us in a way that that sometimes statistics don't. They, They capture your imagination. He would tell these parables, he would tell these stories in such a way that it left the hearer going, what's that about? And it would, call, it, would, it would mess with you. It'd be something that you should be thinking about as you're laying on your pillow at night. You're like, what's the seed about? Like, what soil? What's the soil? Like, like, that's what the stories do. I was listening to a podcast this week um, of one of my favorite authors, Cal Newport. He's written about digital minimalism and, and technology and all that fun stuff. And he has a new book coming out, uh, just came out, called Slow Productivity. I'm gonna read that before my sabbatical. I'm looking forward to it. Um, but in the, in the interview, the, the interviewer asked Cal and said, hey, I, I've read all of your books. He's written like eight or so books. And he said, I've read all your books, but this one feels different. Is that just me or is there, is there something different about this book? He said, I feel like there, you used more stories and narrative in this one than your previous books. Am, am I onto something? And Cal says, yes, I actually, I did spend a little bit of time rethinking how I write. Cal Newport said, "Um, I've kind of gotten to grow, I'm not enjoying how most books these days are just filled with study after study after study. I don't know if you you read much, but you see this. It's like the University of Pennsylvania says 20% of this, says this, and this, this, this. And it's like, studies are cool, but, and, and most of his other books have a lot of these studies. And he says, I wanted to emphasize narrative. He said, because when you speak in narrative, when you hear a narrative, it speaks to the gut. Like it, it just gets inside of you a different way than a study does. And this is why Jesus tells parables. He, 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 he's having this story resonate with your soul. Now the issue is most of us aren't farmers. Some of you may be, but many of us aren't. In that day, many of them would have been. So this, this sticks to their brains in a way that maybe it, it doesn't as much with us. And yet, I, I want to flesh it out a little bit and then we'll get to the interpretation. But, but basically he says this, there's a sower, there's a farmer, right? And this sower has seeds and he's throwing seeds all around. Some of the seeds land on the path, hard ground. And as the seed just lays there on the path, these birds end up coming and stealing the seed away. It didn't sink into the soil. Then there's the rocky ground, the, the, the soil that's filled with rocks. And this seed actually lands in, and it, because it has not much of a foundation, it sprouts quickly. But because there's not much soil, because the root can't take root, the, the sun scorches it and it vanishes. That third soil is the, the thorny soil. It's, it's the seed goes into it, and as it begins to grow, the thorns choke it out, and it remains unfruitful. And then the fourth soil is the good soil. It's the soil where the seed takes into the soil and it grows and it produces fruit, some a hundredfold, some 60-fold, some 30-fold. So that's his story. What does it mean? Let's keep going. Verse 10. <clears throat> then the disciples came up and asked him, why are you speaking to them in parables? He answered, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That's why I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand." Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn back, and I would heal them. Blessed are your eyes, because they do see and your ears because they do hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people 
longed to see the things you see, but didn't see them, to hear the things you hear, but didn't hear them. So picture the scene. Jesus has this massive crowds. Crowds are showing up. They're following Jesus. The disciples are excited. And after he finishes this parable, it it is kind of confusing. Sometimes the gospels, um, they're not always perfectly chronologically based. And so they kind of mix things around at times. Um, And so as I was reading this story, I was like, if you just take it as Matthew 13, he's sitting by the sea, a large crowd shows up, he teaches this short parable, and then it's over. And then the disciples are like, hey, what was that all about? It's almost like he just got up there on the boat, probably took like five minutes to get out there. He talks for like 45 seconds about the story. He's like, good night. And he just kind of like walks away. And the disciples are confused. They're like, what do you do? Like, well, you had a prime opportunity. Thousands of people are here. Like, why would you tell them this goofy story that didn't make any sense? Like, Jesus, let's teach you how to do things, right? Um, and, and, and so they're, they're like confused at what he's doing. They're like, why are you doing this? And Jesus explains. He explains why he told the crowds these parables. And he says a couple things, but, but most commentators say there's two main reasons. One, to reveal and two, to conceal. So, so one, he tells these stories to reveal himself, to reveal what his kingdom is like. Most of the parables are about the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is where God's reign is, where, where people do what God wants them to do, where people enjoy him and worship him. That's where his kingdom is. And so Jesus is revealing what the kingdom is like. And in context for these early listeners, as Jesus is going about bringing his kingdom into the world, one of the questions the earliest disciples are going to have is, Jesus, why when we tell people about you, some people receive it and other people want to kill us? This is why he's telling the story. It reveals what his kingdom's like. But on the flip side, he also tells parables to conceal his identity to conceal things so that he's interested to see who actually wants this. Like some people who are following Jesus at this time, all they want are the healings and the bread. Like Jesus, Jesus would have been a cool guy to be around. Free bread, free healings, free stuff all the time. Like you're like, I'm hanging out with this guy. Jesus is like, I love you here, but this isn't the end of it all. The, The end of it all is him. And so he would tell these parables and it would kind of weed people out. Some people are like, "Uh, is the story over? Where's my bread? And Jesus is like, okay, Um, like, sure. Uh, So he's he's concealing his own identity. And and here's another reason why he's concealing his identity. Because Jesus is the king. And Jesus does not show up on day one of his public ministry and going, hey, everyone, I'm the king. Why? Because then he would get killed on day one. Um, at that time, Israel is under the occupation of Rome. Rome basically governing most of the world at that point. Rome already has a king. And Rome doesn't love that there might be another king. I'm currently reading a, a book on Roman history called Pax by Tom Holland. Not Tom Holland, the Spider-Man guy, <laughs> uh, but Tom Holland, the historian. The historian. And um, I actually didn't even know that it was his name. I was like, Tom Holland. So I was like, Spider-Man wrote a book? I was like, no, he didn't. So um, <laughs> it's a great book. It's called Pax. Pax, it's about Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. It was about a 200-year period of, of relative peace in the Roman Empire, um, of just incredible economic blessing and all this unprecedented levels of wealth and peace. In the midst of all this peace, I just read one of the chapters um, a week ago, There was uh, one year, I believe it was AD 69, where there were four different emperors. One year. Imagine if we had one year and there were four different presidents. That'd be a a tumultuous year. And this is one year in the Roman Empire where there were four different emperors. How do you become a Roman emperor at that point? You assassinate the guy who's ahead of you. You don't just show up and be like, hey, I'm going to run for king. It's like, he's king, he's emperor, I need to kill him. So, so literally, it's like somebody stands up, and, and the reason why in 69 AD, I think in 60, eh, 68, 70, um, Nero committed suicide. He was the emperor, he committed suicide, and he left the throne, and he didn't name who his successor was going to be. 
So people are like, I'll do it. And so people step up, assassination. Step up, assassination. Um, Jesus is living in that realm about 30 years before that, but it's still under the Roman Empire. And he is not going to just step up and go, hey, I'm a king. Because the world knows what kings do. They take, they kill, they do whatever they need to bring their agenda forward. Jesus has to first reorient their minds about the type of king he is. He's an altogether different king. He is not a king who takes life. He's a king who gives his own life for the benefit of others. And so it's going to take time for Jesus to help people see that. And so he tells these stories in some ways to reveal himself and in other ways to conceal himself. And as he continues on, he explains what this parable is all about. So verse 18. So listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields some a hundred, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. So he explains the parable. He's like, this is what this is about. And he starts by explaining what the seed is. He, he says it's, it's the message about the kingdom. The, the message about the kingdom. Um, the kingdom of God is wherever God's rule and reign is actively present. And, and this is Jesus' main message in the Gospels, that this is what he has come to do. He has come, think back to Genesis 1, what we had learned. God creates this beautiful world. It's good. He places these two people in the garden, Adam and Eve. He's establishing his kingdom on earth as it was in heaven. And he tells them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Trust me, obey me, enjoy me, and go. But instead, they want their own kingdom. They rebel against the king and they say, we'll do things our own way, which we've been doing ever since. And, and so we, we did our own little assassination and coup in the garden and said, thank you, but no thanks. We make fun of the people who are like, oh, they just wanted bread and healing. That's what we did as humanity. We're like, God, no thanks. Mark Sayer says, we want the kingdom without the king. Th that's our problem as a, as a people. And so God in his grace, instead of coming back down and crushing humanity for our rebellion, he says, I'm going to still love you and pursue you and make all things right. I'm offering you forgiveness if you'll turn and follow me. And he came back to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, ultimately through Jesus who is the saving king. At the center of the kingdom is the king, Jesus. And every time the message of the kingdom goes out, it's like the sower throwing a seed out onto the different types of soils. And it's happening right now. It's happening around churches around the globe. It's been happening for thousands of years. And as the seed goes out, different responses of our hearts occur. He names four in particular. Uh, created a little... Um, alliteration. They all start with D that maybe help you remember it. But the first one is the disinterested soil. Look at verse 19. <clears throat> when anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. See, the disinterested soil is the one who hears the word about the kingdom, hears Here's the thing about the kingdom. It's very simple. There is complexities to where you can write 1,700 pages and it never ends in its depth and beauty. 
But there's a simplicity that even a child can understand about the kingdom. God is king, you are not. He loves you, you've rebelled. Do you want to receive forgiveness and enjoy him and partner with him and now bringing his kingdom to earth? It's very simple. But, but as the seed goes out, some of our hearts do not understand it. Now, I don't believe this has anything to do with our intelligence, because like I said, children can understand this. This is why Jesus over and over throughout this parable and many of his parables keeps using several different words over and over. Listen, hear. The person who's disinterested in the gospel, the person who rejects the kingdom and doesn't understand it is the person who hears it and doesn't allow it to take root in their life. That they have so many other voices, they have so many other things that are on their mind and as it sits there bare on the surface of their heart, the enemy, Satan, plucks it's like, you don't want that? I'll take that. I don't want you, I don't want you thinking about that too long. Here we go. And, and so it's the heart that just kind of goes, eh, interesting, but whatever. I got other things to think about. Now, now this is what's fascinating about the disciples. The disciples seem to be like that at the beginning be because they, they don't even understand what these parables are about. Most of the time, the disciples don't get what the parables are about. And Jesus doesn't go, shame on you for asking me. You should have known. The disciples come to Jesus and go, we don't get it. And he goes, yes, good job. Let me explain more. That's what Jesus is after. I think most of us, if we heard Jesus in the flesh telling a parable, we'd go, mm, that's a good one, Jesus. Like, do you, do you get that? No, I don't get it. Just pretend. That's not what the disciples do. The disciples are like, sower, seed, soils? I'm confused. And he's like, yes, the parable is to bring you closer to Jesus. The way to understand a parable is to keep asking about the parable. It's not an IQ test like, who's really brilliant and understands soils? It, it's, it's to cause your heart to go, what, what is he saying here? and to actually draw me closer to him. But the disinterested disciple hears the parable and they're like, nice, got any bread? Like that's the heart posture. The second one is the disturbed. Look at verse 20. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Sounds good so far. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. This person hears the gospel and they're like, yes, let's do this. I'm in. And then something hard happens and they're like, I'm out. It's, it's as quickly in as quickly out. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with youth camps. I was a youth camp, I was a youth pastor for a while, junior high, high school, and there's something about camp that is so exciting. I mean, you get these kids up on a mountaintop away from their phones. It's just like them and Jesus. And almost all of them get saved every single time. It's just like every kid is like, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry, you're amazing. And you're like, yes, it's working. And then you come back down the mountain and they're like, oh, Instagram, you know, way better. It's just everything else is just way more exciting or life gets hard, or it's fun following Jesus when there's a hundred other students following Jesus, and then you go back to your school and not many kids are following Jesus, and you're like, uh, no thanks. This is this soil of the rocky ground. It, it's, it's quick, it's happy, it's joyful, and then it's gone. And it's not just kids. It, it's us. I mean, guys, I, I was already thinking this morning, there's people We've baptized over the last eight years where on baptism Sunday, that was the last time I ever saw them. And it's devastating. It's just like an excitement. Oh, Jesus, yes, his kingdom, I'm in. Baptize me, boom, here we go. It's like, where'd they go? <laughs> They're off to the next thing. Just everything's exciting, wanna jump in. And then life is hard. And as we sang in that first song, Jesus is our anchor in the storm. That's true salvation. When he's your anchor in the storm, you're going to hit storms. 
What what does an anchor do? It holds you in place as your boat just gets destroyed. (laughs) But you don't move. You're, You're still there. He keeps you. But many of us don't see Jesus as that anchor. We see him more as like an accessory. We kind of throw him in. You hear about Jesus and forgiveness, you're like, that sounds nice. I feel a little guilty at times. Forgiveness, throw it on. And then life's hard and you're like, hey, I didn't sign up for this. This is why Jesus constantly throughout the gospels, he's saying, count the cost. If you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Jesus does not pretend this is going to be easy. So anytime I meet somebody, they're like, I'm in. Here we go. Let's go. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm excited. I'm excited. You're excited. Do you really want him? And now why do we still do baptisms as opposed to like, let's wait three years? Because the Bible, they baptize. It acts. 3,000 people respond on that day. And they're like, sweet, let's get them baptized. So, So baptism is a first step of going, I'm following Jesus. Absolutely. But baptism isn't the end of your story. It's just the beginning. And so we do celebrate baptisms. We don't like look at baptism like, we'll see. Like, no, no, no. We celebrate. We <laughs> joyfully celebrate and assume they're good soil. Yeah. But we also will see. And, and, and so this is that, the, the, um, that second type that, uh, on the rocky ground, the disturbed soil. The third one is the distracted soil. Look at verse 22. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. I think this one starts hitting a little closer to home. I mean, these are, these are church folk. I mean, you're like, oh, not me. I got baptized. Look at me. I'm still here, Brad. Cool. This third one is the distracted, dis, distracted soil. It's the one who hears the word, says yes. The seed begins to take root. The seed even begins to sprout. But the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth begin to choke you out to where you are unfruitful. See, over and over, Jesus is going to say, listen, listen to my message about the kingdom. Let it take root. And you're like, I did, but I'm almost also listening to my bank account. I'm also listening to my family. I'm listening to my job. I'm listening to everything else out there. Not bad things necessarily, but they take precedence over Jesus' kingdom and it chokes the life out of you. I remember I was at a youth camp and some preacher preached this sermon and some other counselor comes up to me as, after the sermon and he said, hey, we were, we were debating like who's saved in this parable? Is it like, are you saved if you're the, in the rocky soil or the, you know, is it really saved and then you lose your salvation and then the thorny soil, are you saved but you're just unfruitful? And he was like, good news is, I think if you're in the thorny soil, you're still saved. And I was like, not a great way to live your Christian life, though. It's like, what's the bare minimum requirement for me to be in the kingdom? Like, like does, if any, anyone want to describe your life as, a, I'm just being choked out 24-7. <laughs> like, I'm saved, but I'm choking. It's like, that's not what we're going for. And yet that's what most of us, men are, we're so captivated by so many things. Worry. We're worrying about so much. The more you worry, the less you hear and understand and enjoy Jesus as king. The deceitfulness of wealth. The the more money you have, the less you have to trust Jesus. That's what's so exciting about money. You're like, I have control. That's why Jesus said, "You, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one or hate the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money isn't evil. First Timothy says it's the love of money that's evil. Money, money's a gift. It's a gift from God, and yet it can become a curse when it dominates our minds and begins to choke out the life 
in us. And that last seed is that disciple, that soil of the disciple. Verse 23, but the one sown on the good ground, this is one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields some a hundred, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. This disciple receives the word of God. They hear it, they understand it, and they produce fruit. Are you hearing the word today? Do, do, you, do you listen to the word? Not, not just on a Sunday, friends. I, I don't think a one sermon a, su- a week is sufficient. And I'm not saying go listen to another hundred sermons on podcasts and YouTube. I'm just saying, what are you filling your days with? What are you filling your mind with? You don't even have to be reading scripture. You don't have to be listening to a sermon. What's going on in your thoughts? Are you preaching the good news of the kingdom to yourself? When you encounter a difficult situation, are you reminding yourself that there actually is a king who loves me and is for me? Or should I just worry and freak out about all these things? That's that's an every moment decision you and I have. And the choice is yours. What, What are you hearing? What are you understanding? One of the challenges of being in the church, some of you have been in the church for decades, and some of you have grown immensely and you are mature believers in Christ. Other people can be in the church for decades and they're the same person they were 30 years ago because hearing isn't enough. Do you understand it? And and so many people, like we're all terrified to be the one person who raises our hand and goes, what does that mean? Because everyone's going to look at you and be like, what do you, you don't get it, you're the only one, which is rarely the case. And even if it is the case, guess what? It's important for you to know. But so often, we're those disciples where Jesus tells a story and we're like, mm, that's a nice story. What's that mean? I don't know. It's just really nice. Like, we can't, we can't even explain what the gospel is. When we hear about the kingdom, we're like, that's, okay, cool, kingdom, I don't know what that means, but... Do do we understand it? How do we understand things more? We ask questions, we study, we read, we listen over and over to the scriptures. We wanna be a people that we don't just hear things, we wanna hear them and then understand them. Let the seed of God's word take root in our hearts and as it does, it produces fruit. Unfortunately, Jesus doesn't define fruit, even though he interprets the whole parable. I'm like, you didn't define the fruit, Jesus. Um, What's the fruit? Generally speaking, there's probably two main types of fruit. There's an internal fruit where you're actually becoming like Jesus. Your, Your character is reflecting the character of Jesus in who you are and what you do. And then there's also an external fruit, a fruit of what you produce in the world a fruit of what you not just becoming like Jesus, but you helping other people become like Jesus. Of you preaching the gospel to other people, of you demonstrating the gospel through your words and your deeds, your actions that people would experience and then want more of Jesus because of what they see in your life. Two main things this parable does for us. The first one is that it challenges us to evaluate where we are at. Like, like where are you at? In these four soils, like, like where do you think you are? Uh, Bruner, in his commentary on this passage, he's quoting another commentary, some other scholar, but it's kind of all over the place, so I'll just read it together. He says this, our text, Matthew 13, becomes especially fatal when we understand the first three soils as others, Israel or the unchurched, and the fourth soil as ourselves. The text works as it was intended to work only when it is used self-critically. For Matthew assumes that in the church there are people who are completely untouched by the gospel even though they hear it all the time. 
Should we not wonder about ourselves if we hear this parable honestly? You and I have an awful tendency when we hear sermons like this to begin diagnosing everyone else we know. Right? Like, like the disturbed disciple, you're like, oh, my, Brad, you're describing my coworker exactly. <laughs> I, oh, I wish they were here. This would have been such a good sermon for them. <laughs> You, you, yeah, when you're talking about the distracted one, that's, that's my family member. And if they were here, you, I'm gonna send them this. Brad, thank you so much for preaching this sermon to my friend. That's our heart tendency. Jesus wasn't preaching this to other people. He's preaching it to you. And this parable will not take root if you assume you're the good soil. We're like, oh, good soil, because I'm here. I'm a churchgoer, definitely good soil. 100, 100 yield fruit, maybe not. I'll be humble, maybe a 60 kind of guy. But, but do you just assume you're good soil? I think it's safest for all of us in this room to assume we're one of the first three. Assume it, and then let a life of fruit give you evidence to push you into the fourth. But, but which of the first three are you? Where, where are you at? Where, where am I at when I'm, I'm thinking man, that worry has dominated me the last few months? And I, I, I never experienced anxiety in my first couple decades of life. I, I, I didn't know what anxiety was. And then into my late 20s and early 30s, I'm like, hmm, this has become a friend that I hate, <laughs> that just feels present way too often. And the more I'm worrying about you name it, the less I'm allowing the seed of God's word to penetrate my heart so that I can produce fruit. Where are you at? The second thing this parable does is it compels us to share the gospel of the kingdom with others. It, when you become good soil, you then basically also become a sower. You produce a hundred yield of fruit. You then give that to others. And as bad as we are to quickly assume other people, here, we are not great at judging what type of other soils people are. We're just not. We like to think we are. Like, oh, definitely distracted, disturbed, I know, I know. You don't know. You can't know. You can't know until the gospel has come into their life. And I think many of us, we go into our workplaces on Monday, we're like, bad soil, bad soil, bad soil. Might be good soil. Maybe I'll share the gospel with them. And Jesus is like, what? How do you get to decide who's the good and bad soil? You don't get to. So you become a sower who does the same thing as this sower. You sow the seed widely on the good and the bad soil. Josh Ryan Butler, in his book, The Pursuing God, he has a whole chapter, a few chapters, on this one parable. And the, he has the audacity to name the chapter title The Dumb Farmer. I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, Yikes. I think the farmer's God. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's brilliant. Here's, here's why. He says, most of us, when we read this sermon, we read this parable the first time, our first question is, what kind of soil am I? Butler goes, the question I have is, what kind of a dumb farmer is this? Who's just throwing seeds at her? Seeds cost money. I mean, it, don't you want to be a little more careful don't you want to make sure it's good soil first and take time to gently put the seed in? Not this farmer. This farmer wants the seed to go to everyone. This farmer even knows the heart of yours, even if it's bad soil. He doesn't go, ooh, not worthy of the seed of the gospel of the kingdom to be proclaimed to you. He goes, I want you to hear it. I want you to hear it again and again and again and again and again and maybe just once you'll hear it. Maybe just once you'll understand it. Like friends, how many times did it take for you to hear the gospel before you responded? 
I was 20 years old. I was paid in the church for two years before the gospel took root in my heart. I was preaching about this stuff, and I still didn't get it. What a gracious king to not give up on me. What a gracious and generous farmer to keep seeing a lost kid like I was. And he goes, here we go. This next one, this next one, this next one. And it was finally through a sower named Bobby Reif who told the gospel to me in a way that finally made sense. And I was like, never heard that before. He's like, yeah, you have. You just, you just didn't understand it. Friends, maybe today's the first day you're understanding that God loves you. That he, he is the king and you're not the king. And that might seem threatening, but it's really good news. Because you can look over your shoulder and see what kind of a kingdom you're building. And he's going, I've got a better one for you. Will you come with me? Will you turn from your sin? Will you turn from your rebellion? Will you just trust me? Receive the good news of the grace. That's all the soil has to do. It has to receive. Soil doesn't do much. It just sits there. Will you receive his grace today? And then as you receive it, will you bring it to others? Let's pray. As we sit there, uh, there should be an Easter flyer on your seat. I want you to pick it up if you can, if there's one near you. I just want you to hold it in your hand. We're gonna spend a minute of just listening to God and, and, and I think one of the ways we can sow seeds of the kingdom as simple as an invitation to Easter. It isn't the fullness of sowing a seed, but it is certainly a part of it. So God, would you give us a specific person? You know the soils of the hearts infinitely better than we do. Would you give us a name of someone that you're inviting us to invite to Easter in the next couple weeks with this fire? Would you speak to us now? Jesus, would you soften our hearts? We would be that good soil that produces a hundredfold fruit, Lord. A fruit that is pleasing to you. A fruit that's enjoyable for us. God, it's exhausting living a life of being choked. Would you set us free? Will we boldly, courageously, and humbly follow you? God, would you, would you fill up three services of men and women on Easter to hear the word? We don't know how it's going to be responded to. We don't know the soils of our hearts at times. But would the gospel go out and would men and women respond and enter your kingdom We love you, we trust you, it's in your beautiful name, amen.